this is Kalimara here, and no, it's not Calamari. Ramadan Mubarak to my brothers and sisters who are currently fasting. I'm back with another redesign and rewrite because art and writing are just something we like to do around here. If this is something you're interested in, be sure to check out the other redesign and rewrite videos I've done because I have several playlists of those. Before we get into the video, I have an exciting announcement. I've collaborated with Bonfire to launch my very first merch line. The amazing designers at Bonfire helped me create this adorable design of a hydrake pup living its best life. And if you don't know what a hydrake is, it's a closed species I created recently as a gift to my subscribers. Because all my subscribers get a complimentary hydrake. We have shirts in a range of cute colors, so if you want to support me and get bragging rights for having the first merch line I ever launched, do consider grabbing one because it's only available for a limited time and after that, it's gone for good. Orders close on the 30th of April, so make sure to grab one before then. And with that, let's dive right into the video! Gabe, 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 what to do with you? If people want to talk about Miraculous Ladybug's wasted potential, then there really is no better example than Gabriel Agreste, Paris's reclusive, top fashion designer, father to Adrian Agreste, and most importantly, the series' main villain, Hawk Moth. His role in the show arguably rivals the main protagonist herself as most of the time, he's the show's means of pushing the story forward, and yet he himself, despite his supposed burning determination to achieve his goals, really only puts in just enough effort to get there. Like he's working a part-time job he didn't really want to do, but he still needs to work hard enough to get paid. And that's the completely wrong attitude to have as a villain. See, reluctance and hesitance to do their job is a hero thing. In almost every single media involving superpowers, especially the magical girl genre, the heroes are kind of just dragged into saving the city or the world. They don't really want to do it and they'll complain a bunch about having to do it because they'd rather chase after boys or be an average girl. But they have to do it because they're the only one that can save the day and they have quote unquote such a strong moral compass. Villains, on the other hand, take the initiative. They hustle. They're they're the ones making moves and pushing down the first domino that will lead to the chaos that the hero has to fix. They're always very passionate about their cause, to the point they will do anything to achieve their goals, whatever their goal may be. Which is why they constantly scheme and plan. They try different angles and strategies to see if they can find a crack that they can take advantage of. They make things happen. Meanwhile, Hawk Moth comes up with one plan and thinks, yeah, that's good enough. I mean, he literally gives the exact same instruction to all his akumatized villains in every single episode. And even when he had an actual henchman, that being Mayura, he couldn't figure out a way to utilize her abilities other than to make henchmen for his akumatized villains. I mean, she had better ideas than he did, coming up with Optigami to actually find out the identities of Cat Noir and Ladybug. And yet, the show tells us that Gabriel Agreste is an incredibly intelligent man, you guys. Trust us. He is literally the dumbest, most pathetic character in all of Miraculous, and that's saying something. I genuinely don't know what the show is trying to do with this character. They try to make him a serious, sympathetic villain that would be revered by the audience, but I just can't take him seriously. I mean, look at him! He looks like he's wearing a toupee, his glasses are way too big for his face and make him look goofy, his pants are fire engine red, oh, and let's not forget, white Oxford shoes with red laces. Sir, who looked at this and thought, yeah, now that's a classy, sophisticated guy? Because to me, it's giving middle-aged man who works in a trendy office space trying to fit in with a bunch of 20-something tech bros. No matter what, I just associate him with Doofenshmirtz. But at least Doofenshmirtz was a fun villain. Actually, now that I think about it, Hawkmoth has a lot in common with Doofenshmirtz. 
They both have the same monologue they repeat in every episode about what they want. They're both bad fathers who are separated from their wives. And they keep getting foiled by a hero they fail to recognize despite their incredibly simple disguise. But you know what? At least Doofenshmirtz tries to be a good father. And he comes up with a different invention and plan every episode. And yeah, they're all goofy machines ending in Inator. But at least he tries to take over the tri-state area in different ways and isn't just creating new villains and telling them to do the exact same thing he tells all the other villains. Okay, sure, the first few times he did it made sense. He wants to draw the cat and ladybug miraculouses into circulation again, but the other hundred times? I don't know, man. You're probably influential enough to just take over the city, putting public pressure on Ladybug and Cat Noir to hand over their miraculouses or something. And speaking of Hawk Moth, I wasn't speaking of Hawk Moth before, but I think it, it warrants mentioning. Can I just say how dumb his mask is? It looks like it's vacuum sealed to his face, and every time I see him, I think I think he's a wrestler or Howard the Alien underneath his purple suit. Though it is an improvement from his civilian attire, it's dreadfully bare. It's incredibly flat and has a horrible visual flow, and I think the main issue is that there's nothing on his head area that would encourage you to look further than his torso, which only emphasizes how thumb-like and goofy his head looks. I find that a bit silly, considering he's the holder of the Butterfly Miraculous. You know butterflies? The bugs with the flashiest wings out there? And this is even more silly because he's supposed to be Paris's top fashion designer. The cardinal rule of storytelling is show, don't tell. And for a show so focused on artistic, fashionable characters, there's an abhorrent lack of style. Also, what is it with Miraculous and naming heroes that are only tangentially related to what their Miraculous actually is? First it was Vesperia with the bee Miraculous, despite Vespers being wasps, and now it's a moth for a butterfly Miraculous? Why not make the snake Miraculous a gecko then? Or have the peacock Miraculous be a turkey? Do these people not know their taxonomy? And personality-wise, Gabriel is just a walking contradiction. He's overprotective of his son to the extent that he's completely sheltered and isolated him socially, but will also willingly and purposefully throw him into harm's way for his plans. Even Doofenshmirtz never stooped that low. He stated to be cool and calculating in the show, and yet he constantly puts his eggs in one basket and is then caught off guard when, surprise surprise, it doesn't work out, because why would it, when it hasn't worked all those times before, and somehow, he's never prepared with a plan B, unless the show conveniently hands him another person to akumatize. Sometimes, he genuinely wants to be a better dad to Adrian, but other times, he really couldn't care less about his son, despite him forcing Adrian to do all those extracurricular activities in the first place. He's supposedly desperate to save his wife and is determined to get the ladybug and cat miraculous to an obsessive degree, but will passively wait until a victim is handed to him on a silver platter. Gabriel just behaves however the writers need him to behave for a particular story beat. The only thing that is consistent about Gabriel is that he can gaslight gatekeep girl boss his way through any social interaction, which I don't think was the takeaway the show intended. But then, I guess if Gabriel were any smarter, the show would just be over right away because he could have just paid someone to like follow Ladybug and Cat Noir, see them transform, find out their identities, and then like pay a pickpocket to steal Marinette's earrings, confiscate Adrian's ring, and there will be no more show, which at this point is probably a blessing for me. This might be a hot take, but I think Gabriel is more of a wasted character than Chloe is. Because whether or not Chloe actually got a redemption arc would be a very minor change in Miraculous' story. Because Chloe never had a major role in the first place. She was only a minor inconvenience meant to supplement Marinette as a character. A, a prop, if you will. It would have earned the show a lot of praise from their audience, but would it have made their story a better one? In my opinion, I don't think so. At least not overall. If only because knowing the writing team, Chloe is just going to be pushed into the background and have as much significance as Alia or Nino. 
She's just going to be like friend number 10 who occasionally sasses Marinette. Meanwhile, I believe that Gabriel's shortcomings as a character may be the reason why Miraculous Ladybug fails to be compelling to the older end of their all ages demographic, especially those who didn't have any sentimental value for it. And I do want to clarify that that's not necessarily a bad thing. If you want to appeal exclusively to a young audience and some adults also happen to enjoy the show, that's totally fine. But don't try to have it both ways, you know? Don't tout the show as some sophisticated, multi-layered piece of social commentary that warrants deeper examination, and then fall back on the, oh, it's just meant for kids excuse when people do examine the show more deeply and discover contradictions in the show's own narrative and message. So if you're kind of on the fence about my take on this, especially if you're a hardcore Chloe fan I might have just accidentally annoyed, I'm going to show you how I think Hawk Moth and Gabriel can be better utilized to tighten up Miraculous's overall narrative. After all, one could say that the most important part of a good superhero story is a good villain. So let's make Gabriel a good villain. So you're probably wondering why I'm going with the current design I am now, and shocking as it may sound, I'm actually just implementing what I think the show was trying to do with Gabriel in the first place. They've just implemented it very poorly. If you think I'm crazy for making the design the way it is, let me just say that if all the Gabriel thirst traps are of any indication, I don't think I'm the only one who picked up on this either. See, Gabriel is 7 foot 2. Yes, canonically, he is 220 centimeters or 7 foot 2. And as we see from his skin tight shadow noir costume, Mans is also ripped. Uh, spoilers by the way. He could easily play in the NBAs if he wanted to. Gray hair, perfect posture, well dressed, or what the show considers to be well dressed, rich, and considered by many characters to be intelligent. Mans is straight up a silver fox. And yet, in reality, Gabriel looks like young Sheldon. Not grown adult Sheldon from the Big Bang Theory, but the spin off series Sheldon specifically. It's like an old person dressing the way his 10 year old self thinks is a sophisticated adult. And if you think that's contradictory, then you now understand how I view Gabriel. So really, I'm just streamlining the concept and helping him achieve his full potential. As you might have seen, I've given Gabe a different pair of glasses and a bit more volume to his hair. Because his current hairstyle looks really flat and accentuates just how narrow and long his head is, the glasses he wears originally sits way too high on his face. To me, they kind of look like granny glasses, which is another factor that contributes to me not being able to take him seriously. Gabriel has an oblong face shape, and the type of frames generally recommended for oblong faces are square, tall lenses to offset the length of the face. I decided with a shorter lens because I wanted to keep that face length because I think it's pretty unique to him. You can wear any kind of glasses you want, obviously, but I think Gabriel being a fashion designer would be someone who really pays attention to these things. Another change I made was turning the outer corners of his eyes upwards to give him more of a fox eye look. I find that upturned eyes give characters a more intelligent or sly appearance, or can even imply that the character has secrets that they're hiding, depending on how low their eyelids rest. This is yet another reason why I can't take Gabriel's original design seriously. OG Gabe has downturned eyes, which is commonly a characteristic of more mild mannered laid-back, kind-hearted characters since they resemble doe or puppy dog eyes. So seeing that on a character that's meant to be cold and closed off just felt dissonant to me personally. Of course, they could have played it so that Gabe behaves like a kind, smiley person on the outside who appears warm and welcoming but is actually pure evil on the inside. Male yanderes are a thing after all. But instead, they just made him a cold character, gave him mild-mannered droopy eyes, and did nothing to play on the dichotomy, which just made it seem like a strange or poorly thought out design choice. Otherwise, I kept his face structure more or less the same. Gabe has a strong rectangular angular jaw and sunken cheeks, and I tried to include that as best as I could in my redesign. His suit was kind of a challenge. It's pretty tricky to add flair to 
a suit because it's already a pretty fancy kind of dress for men without it turning out the way Gabriel's suit originally looks. But I found that one way to add flair to a suit without making it look tacky was by adding accessories. You've probably seen things like lapel pins and pocket watches, but the accessories I decided to use for my design were these chain-linked gem pieces, and I'm not sure what they're called, but some guys will also add these chain links to the collars of their dress shirts. And later on, I also added a fancy handkerchief in his pocket. I also thought it would be coy of him to wear gems that are identical to the Butterfly Miraculous as a decoy, as you're not sure which one is the real Miraculous. Additionally, I didn't just want any regular suit jacket, I found this suit that had these upturned lapels that resembled his original Hawkmoth suit and I thought it would be a nice touch to add. And speaking of Hawkmoth, when I was designing his new look, I just watched The Batman starring Robert Pattinson. And can I just say, I loved how terrifying he looks just standing menacingly at the crime scenes. One of my favorite things about this new Batman is his mask. See, the costume designers decided that they wanted the mask to show off Robert's jawline and that was definitely one of the first things I noticed when he first appeared on screen. It left a huge impression on me and I knew it would be a perfect match for my redesign of Hawkmoth too. The current Hawkmoth mask only leaves the hole around his mouth and the fact that it's just clinging to the shape of his head is giving very ski mask bank robber. Actually, his original design reminds me a lot of Red Skull, except gray. I do understand the purpose of his mask being full coverage and I debated keeping that full coverage in my new design as well because Batman pulls it off really well, but it still presented the same uncanny feeling as the original, even with a more structured mask and hat. And so I ended up giving him the tuxedo mask treatment and letting his hair out, but with some alterations to hide his identity of course. Fun fact, the hat was actually inspired by my favorite Pokemon NPC ever, Riley from Pokemon Diamond and Pearl. I had a huge crush on him when I was a kid, and I still have a crush on him now. Another major change in the design, as you might have noticed, was the addition of a cape and a tail coat. When I initially designed this costume, I stuck closely to the sleek, minimalistic look of the original. But then I realized it was that very sleekness that made Hawkmoth look so unthreatening and unmysterious. Villains need flair, and what could be more dramatic than a dark cape fluttering in the wind, obscuring the wearer's body, hiding what he's doing with his hands, and obscuring the pursuer's vision when he makes an escape. I purposefully designed the coat to imitate how butterfly and moth wings overlap with each other, and when he jumps, the cape and tail coat fully extend and allow him to glide for a certain distance. With the cape, I also added a high collar inspired by Spider Noir to block his face from the sides and back only giving you a view from the front, which is only possible if he himself permits it, thanks to the brim of his hat which hangs low over his face. Because I think clever obstruction would add more mystery and intrigue than just a full-on head mask. When I started coloring, things got interesting. For Gabriel's civilian design, I decided to go with a full beige suit because warm autumnal colors were quite prominent in the recent Paris Fashion Week and it already matched Gabriel's original suit jacket. I get what the designers were trying to do with the bright red pants and red striped tie. It's a bold pop of color but it unfortunately reads as Christmas to me. Especially that tie. He just looks like a failed attempt at a sexy mall Santa. So I got rid of the red and substituted it with a deep ochre, but when I colored in his silver hair, I started to notice an uncanny resemblance with sexy Colonel Sanders, and that was not the look I was trying to go for. I think it's the pale suit. Because of this, I decided to take a bit of creative liberty and give him that salt and pepper look to give him more of a mature appearance. The pop of color is now reserved to his gem accessory, which I think gives a subtle hint to his identity as Hawk Moth. I think that these subtle changes helped show Gabriel's wealth and opulence a bit more, 
while also showcasing his age and strict personality. For Hawk Moth, I mostly stuck to his original color scheme, though I made sure to incorporate more of the silver accents to his suit to break up all the purple and create more segments to his design. It was in this design that I gave Gabriel his white hair back. Another color change I decided to make were his eyes, which I matched to the gem of the Butterfly Miraculous. I know the original Butterfly Miraculous is a purple gem, but I decided with magenta to help it stand out against Hawk Moth's dominantly purple suit. I know it's possible for characters hair and eye colors to change when they're transformed, so I think this would be a nice way to further conceal Gabriel's identity without putting him in a full head mask. So now, Let's talk about the writing behind Gabriel. This includes aspects such as his personality, motivations, powers, backstory, and portrayal. The bulk of my ideas for my version of Gabriel arguably lays here. I think there are so many fun things you can do with a villain and my goal is to really set up a consistent mood and tone for Gabriel. And don't get me wrong, I think the writing team had a lot of ideas they wanted to do for him. I just think that they didn't always communicate with each other or maybe it's a case of them trying to do too much at the same time leading to the many conflicting actions and decisions you may see Gabriel making in the show. And what do I mean by this? Well, it very strongly seems like they wanted to have a serious villain that is complex and multifaceted who does deplorable things but at the same time sympathetic and has a noble cause for why he's doing what he's doing. However, they also seem to want to make him a simplistic, kid-friendly villain who is goofy and not at all threatening. Even his own minions don't listen to him or take him all that seriously, so why should I? If they just embraced the silliness of it all, it would fit much more neatly into Miraculous's current light-hearted childish tone. However, if they wanted to do a serious villain, then make them scary and actually threatening to the hero. As it stands, Ladybug is easily able to defeat Hawk Moth even without taking her superhero work all that seriously. She's still able to crack jokes, make witty comments, and even act quite smugly or unwise. Hawk Moth has not once been able to put Ladybug into a corner or even get her to break a sweat. And all that shows is that Hawk Moth is a pathetic villain. A villain is meant to be the hero's equal, someone who pushes them to their limits and helps them grow as a person. They are their foil. But with Hawk Moth and Ladybug, it genuinely feels like Hawk Moth is severely outclassed. I get a lot of comments from people saying how much better season 4 is because it dives much more deeply into the character's mental and emotional struggles, but I just want to ask how much of those struggles really have anything to do with the actual threat and plot of the show? How much of Marinette's fears and feelings of inadequacy are actually directly caused by Hawk Moth as opposed to her love for Adrian or just her inner conflict with self-doubt? There is a difference between effective drama and melodrama. Melodrama essentially adds nothing to the plot and may even take away from it. Good drama pushes the plot forward. Unfortunately, a lot of the drama and conflicts in Miraculous Ladybug are just simple melodrama. So let's change that. I'll quickly touch on Gabriel first because at the moment, the show can't really seem to decide whether he is an overly invested helicopter parent who demands nothing short of perfection from his child or if he's an absent parent that's barely around for anything and couldn't care less what his child is up to or how anything in his life is going. My solution is pretty simple. Just Pick one. For the purposes of my rewrite specifically, I'm opting for the absentee parent that neglects his child and entrusts all of his parental responsibilities to Natalie. Unlike the original, he wasn't the one that pushed Adrian into doing all of those extracurricular activities. Adrian decided to do them out of his own free will in order to earn his father's love and attention. But unfortunately, no matter how hard he tried, the distance remained. In my Adrian rewrite, I mentioned that Adrian resents Gabriel and has a strained relationship with him, and this could be one of the reasons why. Because no matter how perfect he is, his father still did not seem to care about him. I think 
This Gabriel genuinely struggles being around Adrian because he reminds him too much of his wife. So their contact is very limited. And the only times they are together are likely for very uncomfortable meals that's cut short by their bickering and one of them leaving early. This distance would also make it easier to explain why he doesn't just figure out Adrian as cat noir right away and vice versa. They just struggle to understand each other and both have a habit of withdrawing from their emotions. So nothing really gets done. And really, at this point, they're just strangers to each other. Gabriel starts off trying to mend his relationship with Adrian, but as the show in my version goes on, his evil deeds start to corrupt him and he soon becomes a completely different man. My idea is that the more he uses his butterfly miraculous to cause destruction and do evil, the more corrupted his mind and the butterfly miraculous becomes. He starts being consumed by negative emotions like greed and ego and starts becoming more obsessed with power and influence, which makes him more and more distant from Adrian and less concerned about his safety when he's executing his plans. But on top of that, he's also breaking the butterfly miraculous and poisoning his body the way the peacock miraculous poisoned his wife. So how does this change affect Hawk Moth? It's probably that he starts off being quite reasonable and reserved in the damage he causes, still being concerned for people's safety, but the more corrupted he becomes, the more destruction he willingly causes. And I have a lot of ideas for Hawk Moth, so strap in. So hypothetically, if I were a writer for the show, the first change I would want to make with this new Hawk Moth is that he does not monologue and we get far less scenes involving him throughout the series. And that's because we want to keep that mystique, that air of mystery and intrigue to him. At the moment, we get at least four Hawk Moth sequences every episode. One where he sends out an Akuma, one where he talks to his target and tells them to get the miraculouses, a whole bunch when he's backseat villaining his akumatized villains, and finally, one where he curses Ladybug and Cat Noir for foiling his plans with a cheesy pun. I think the way things are run now takes away all of the mystery that Hawk Moth had by overexposing him to the audience. And the thing is, it's not always a bad thing that we know the villain well and see them often. It's a bad thing when you grow desensitized to the villain, to the point where you don't really take them seriously. And unfortunately, Hawk Moth's appearances make us realize that this guy isn't as big a threat or as well put together as we initially thought. If anything, it just makes me roll my eyes whenever he comes on screen, which is never the reaction you want to have for the main villain of your entire franchise. But to give the benefit of the doubt, the showrunners probably wanted to keep the tone lighthearted and comedic. But the thing is, they should have avoided doing that to Hawk Ma. He makes a brand new villain every single episode. So the show could have preserved Hawk Moth's image and used them as a source of comedy instead. Or heck, have the comedy aspect come from the heroes themselves. Avatar The Last Airbender did it pretty well. Think of it like this. Imagine if instead of Fire Lord Ozai being this revered, terrifying, mysterious person that every time he comes on screen makes you squirm uncomfortably in your seat from fear and is an ever-present looming threat over the hero's journey. He's just this comical villain that we see him sit in his throne every episode just shaking his fist going, I'm gonna find you, Avatar, I swear it. I don't think Avatar The Last Airbender would have had the same impact it does today. And Avatar The Last Airbender is also just further proof that just because it's a kid show, it doesn't have to be dumbed down for kids to like and enjoy it. So for the first season, completely hide Hawk Moth's appearance. 
Imagine the darkness of the atelier. The window opens up and shines a light onto the room, revealing dozens of white butterflies that begin to take flight. We focus on one butterfly that lands on a gloved hand, silhouetted by the darkness. The butterfly becomes corrupted, and we see the hand moving up to someone's face, where we only see the bottom half of their face. They blow softly on the butterfly, causing it to fly away. As we zoom out, we see the mysterious silhouette of the person that had created the butterfly. And that's more than enough to introduce the villain character. Without even saying a single word, we know from that sequence that this villain is mysterious, he's reclusive, he's hidden. We don't know what he's up to, but we do know that he's up to no good. Let the audience get curious, get intrigued by what this person wants, why they're doing what they're doing, and let those questions be answered as the series goes on, as the hero themselves learn more about the villain with the audience. In each episode, we only see snippets and parts of him. Maybe his shoes, his hat, his hand, his cane, and his body enshrouded by his cape from afar. When the Akuma finds its target and Hawk Moth begins his attempt to convince them to join his side, we only hear the person side of the conversation and not Hawk Moth himself. It almost seems like they're talking to themselves. In the end, we see them succumb. And in the first few episodes, they've simply been told to indulge in their negative emotions and seek vengeance from the person that has wronged them. Once Ladybug and Cat Noir make their appearance, and Hawk Moth is certain that the Ladybug and Cat Miraculouses are back in circulation, we start to hear the Hawk Moth's victims speak of taking the Cat and Ladybug Miraculous and bringing it to him. An extra touch I would add is that Gabriel being the manipulative person that he is, is, manages to build a rapport with his victims that causes them to think positively of him and gaslight them into genuinely believing that Ladybug and Cat Noir are their enemies. Now, here is the real drama. I want it so that people who are akumatized don't just lose all memory of being akumatized. They were fully aware of what they were doing the entire time they became villains, but maybe we could say the Akuma magnifies their negative emotions to the point of villainy, and afterwards, most people feel incredibly guilty and try to make up for what they've done, while a few may continue to harbor that grudge and view Ladybug and Cat Noir negatively for taking away their chance to settle a score. For these people, maybe Hawk Moth will speak to them through the Akuma before it is de-evilized and we hear them apologizing for their failure and say the line, yes, yes, thank you, master, before running away from the scene. And from there, they become devoted to Hawk Moth, who is the first person to listen to them and understand them. And this is exactly what Hawk Moth is banking on. So Ladybug and Cat Noir keep defeating his villains, and this pattern makes up the majority of season 1. In the season finale, we still get Origins 1 and 2, but we completely erase the beginning scene with Gabriel and Nuru. Instead, we replace it with Waze in his bed, having a dream. We see that he's having this abstract nightmare involving the butterfly miraculous and some foreshadowing with Stoneheart. And Waze wakes up with a start, telling Master Fu that he has sensed the butterfly miraculous again and that it is filled with negative energy. We go through the same sequence except this time we get most of the exposition from Tiki, who tells Marinette that the villains are a result of the butterfly miraculous and that someone is using it for evil deeds. The rest of the episode goes on the same way, and this is the first time we hear Hawk Moth's voice talking to his villains, but we don't get to see him just yet. His voice is calm and composed, often amused by the chaos that ensues, and he never once seems bothered by Ladybug and Cat Noir's intervention. Of course, we completely erase Hawk Moth forming his own face out of a swarm of Akumas and demanding that Ladybug and Cat Noir hand over their miraculouses, and instead, he lets the army of stone golems do the work. The finale ends with us finally getting a full, clear view of Hawk Moth. In season 2, 
we start to see an anti-ladybug group forming from the people who sympathizes with and are devoted to Hawk Moth. Ladybug and Cat Noir are well-known superheroes now, but not everyone has nice things to say about them. By now, Hawk Moth has realized that they are a powerful duo and is unlikely to be able to take their miraculouses from them while they're transformed, so he turns his attention to trying to discover their secret identities and grabbing it from them in their untransformed state. So he turns his attention to figuring out their true identities and maybe he does this by having one of the villains tag them with like a tracking device, a bug or something like that. But every time they transform back into their civilian forms, maybe the bug gets destroyed or something like that. So it's been coming up with very little results. And because of that, he is now focusing on gaining more influence by getting more devoted followers. He finds misfits, outcasts, and criminals who have received the short end of the stick all their lives, and he gives them the power to claim what they believe is rightfully theirs. Instead of trying to direct them to get the ladybug and cat miraculouses and constantly barking in their ears to grab it like some backseat driver, he would encourage them to fulfill their desires be it to enact revenge on someone, to gain power or fame, or even take advantage of good intentions like wanting to be a superhero, just like Ladybug and Cat Noir, only to find that their heroes aren't so welcoming after all. He keeps in touch with the individuals who end up resenting Ladybug and admiring him through his akumas, and is quietly orchestrating the anti-Ladybug movement from behind the scenes, maybe giving them directions on political parties to lobby, or even sending generous monetary donations. When another person is defeated by Ladybug and Cat Noir, he instructs the group to visit and recruit them under their ranks. Some desperate people even start seeking out Hawk Moth asking to be akumatized so that they can achieve their goals. And of course, Hawk Moth being the benevolent leader that he is, grants them power in exchange for servitude. It's even a nice parallel to Ladybug giving out miraculouses to her friends. I think this can really set a darker, more threatening undertone to the show's happy-go-lucky romance story, especially if we're following my idea that Ladybug doesn't have a reverse all damage power, which I discussed thoroughly in my first miraculous video. The gist of it is that because Ladybug's power is creation, she should only be able to make things and not reverse damage, because arguably Arguably, she should be able to build new buildings to replace broken ones, but then that would mean she's also creating new people to replace the ones that were transformed, injured, or displaced by the villains. Not to mention, she wouldn't be able to get rid of rubble or debris either, since destruction is specifically Cat Noir's power. So in this version of Miraculous, Paris is probably in pretty rough shape from all the leftover damage and a lot of people are likely still trying to recover from the previous villain attack. People are scared, they're angry, and Hawk Moth is purposefully creating all these negative emotions, but not capitalizing on it by akumatizing people. The original Hawk Moth likely would have just sent akumas without even thinking twice about it, but this Hawk Moth has restraint and a plan. As the season progresses, we see the anti-ladybug society growing in number and influence maybe making appearances at political rallies, and we even see Hawk Moth trying to sway Cat Noir to his side to create a divide between him and Ladybug. The guilt and pressure starts to weigh down on Marinette. In season 3, with public tensions being at an all-time high, Hawk Moth instructs his followers to set up projection screens all over Paris, and he finally reveals his goal. Up until this point, we don't even know what Hawk Moth's actual plan is or why he's doing what he's doing except for maybe a rough idea. We just think, dang, this guy is pure evil and he needs to be stopped. 
But now, we finally get a grand reveal. Hawk Moth announces that all he desires are Ladybug and Cat Noir's miraculouses, and once they are delivered to him, he vows to stop all of his evil deeds and release his hold on the city for good. He gaslights his captive audience into thinking that he's not a bad person, and he doesn't want to harm anyone. He simply wants to help those who have been wronged or cast aside to claim what is rightfully theirs. If they are on his side, then he will ensure that no harm will befall them and that he can grant them exactly what they seek as well. But if you are his enemy, he will be sure to destroy you. And now, it's the innocent citizens of Paris doing his work for him. Frightened people who want all of this to end now crying out to Cat Noir and Ladybug to just give up their powers or flocking to Hawk Moth's cause from fear of his wrath. Even some public figures have begun opposing Ladybug and Cat Noir. At school, Marinette and Adrian have to listen to their friends arguing about whether or not Ladybug and Cat Noir should give up their powers. The villains keep coming, sometimes three to four villains a day from people whose negative emotions were directed toward Ladybug and Cat Noir. But this time, civilians start actively obstructing the heroes, booing them, throwing things at them, telling them to give up their powers and overall discouraging them. Negative emotions are beginning to take over the city of Paris and Hawk Moth makes it very clear that he could easily akumatize the entire city if he so desired. But he is not a selfish villain. Unlike Ladybug and Cat Noir, who he asserts selfishly want to hold on to their power for fame and recognition. And maybe this is when Adrian learns that his father is also Hawk Moth, and the reason he wants to take the cat and ladybug miraculous is to bring back his mother whom he himself have been looking for since he got his powers. And in the season finale, we see Cat Noir turn on Ladybug. Because I think this hypothetical has gone on long enough, let me know what you guys think should happen in season 4 of this hypothetical rewrite. Thank you so much for watching all the way to the end. I really appreciate it and I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I worked pretty hard on it. If you did, be sure to like and subscribe and comment down below to tell me what you think and what ideas you guys have. If you want to support me, please consider grabbing my merch because that would mean a lot to me and I really love the design and I hope you guys like it too. I'm almost at 60k and I'm really looking forward to showing you guys all the other things I have planned. I also want to thank you guys for all the amazing fan arts you've done of my previous redesigns and all the awesome hydrakes you've been sending me. Please tag me in your drawings if you do happen to make them because I love seeing them and I want to start featuring them in my end cards again too. I'm not sure why I stopped, I must have just forgot at one point but I'm trying to keep on top of it. So if you want to see your art in my videos, Send them over to me on my Instagram or Twitter at Kalimara uh, and make sure you follow me on all my social media. Check out my comic because that would make me really happy and I will see you guys in the next video. Goodbye!